we welcome all of you to uh, the present introductory session uh, and we have with us uh, aritra sarkar who is a phd candidate in the department of computer and Co quantum and computer engineering at delft university of technology after completing his bachelor of technology in avionics at the indian institute of space science and technology in 2013 he worked at the indian space research organization as a scientist on onboard data management of satellites till 2016 After completing his Master of Science in Computer Engineering at TU Delft, in 2018 he joined the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Mathematics, and Computer Sciences towards a Doctor of Philosophy. His research interests are in algorithm design for quantum acceleration in experimental algorithmic information theory applications, particularly in artificial general intelligence and geno informatics. And with plethora of exciting research areas that one can explore, as is evident from uh, Aritra's profile. we would request parth to formally welcome our participants and our guest speaker today and start the proceedings parth we are muted sorry ah oh, thanks thanks uh, good evening everyone uh, i am honored to welcome all of you on behalf of AST Alumni Association. We started uh, these series of talks uh, uh, somewhere last year uh, during the lockdown uh, with an intention to share with the larger community about developments in some of these niche fields of technology. Uh, today's is an introductory session on quantum computing, as uh, Vibhuti just told us. Uh, I'm glad to see so many of you uh, joining us for this session. Uh, particular thanks to Qubraid, uh, a startup by Kanav Sethia. and i st alum and i am very particularly excited for this session at is as it is being conducted uh, by my very good friend and ex flatmate uh, aritra i hope uh, all of you have a very productive session today uh, we look forward to your feedback and suggestions to take this series forward uh, so please feel free to leave your comments about what would you like to see next uh, and any feedback or suggestion for this uh, particular session also Uh, once again it is an honor uh, to have you all with us uh, thank you uh yeah aritra over to you sorry i should have told that Thank you, Bhuti, and thank you, Park, for the so elaborate uh, my introduction. So I'll be starting the session. I'll just share my uh, screen. Just give me a moment. Yeah. Um, So uh, in today's session, we'll be exploring uh, what the world of quantum computing is, and uh, as you saw in the poster, it's like the second quantum revolution. So we'll start off with understanding what the second quantum revolution is all about by asking this few questions of what, how, why, when, where, and who. uh so we see a lot of new, uh, hype around the word quantum computing we see a lot of news articles in the last 2 uh, to 5 years if you have like uh, follow science news on on different uh, platforms and some some of these uh, news are very hard to decode so what does this really mean for example a problem where a quantum computer will be able to solve but other computers can't uh there is this uh, term called quantum supremacy which uh, a few companies are now aiming to uh, show or experimentally demonstrate so what does again this term quantum supremacy mean there is again a lot of different terms from uh, the quantum communication fields and recently uh, there are a lot of news from uh, in in the field of communication from in, uh, based on space systems as well as uh, some algorithms which has been demonstrated and uh, like where quantum computing is able to show some benefits where other computation platforms cannot 
So in this session, we are going to look at understanding these kind of news articles and see what what's behind uh, all these the claims that these articles uh, do. So quantum computing is, as I said, is a very hype term. And uh, as you can see in this graph, it's from uh, Gartner. Uh, so quantum computing right now is in what is known as a peak of inflated expectations. So a lot of people are talking about quantum computing, but it is not really producing. Uh, so we are not yet in a world where quantum computing is being used a lot for different kinds of applications. So we are starting to explore what this technology can do or what this technology can't. And we really need to understand much better before uh, we, un we understand the impact of this kind of technology for our daily applications, for example. So what is the second quantum revolution? Of course, if it's the second quantum revolution, there must have been a first. So that uh, the quantum revolution, the first quantum revolution started somewhere in the early 1900s. And this was about understanding the quantum world or uh, before that, we had the classical mechanics from Newton and we had the Maxwellian uh, electromagnetic theory. But then in the early 1900s, uh, we started to understand physics or reality in two new theories, which is general rel relativity and quantum mechanics. So this was all about understanding the physical reality using these laws of quantum mechanics. The second quantum revolution is taking the science of understanding what the quantum world is to technology, like can we manipulate or can we engineer these quantum laws for our own purposes? And can we control this system so that we can do use these laws to do what the things that we want? So you might have come across this uh, wave particle duality experiment. Uh, the double slit experiment is one of the first things that we learned uh, in college on a course of quantum mechanics. And it basically shows that light or quantum particles has a dual nature. So it can behave both as a wave and a particle based on whether, whether you're observing it or not. So that was, again, uh, what happened in the first quantum revolution, understanding these uh, properties of na nature, uh, what happens when uh, with the small minuscule uh, things, the laws that apply over there. But now we want to go a step further and engineer this system. So instead of the light waves going in and hit, hitting on these two slits, let's say we want to put in a cat image over there because you know, like that's one of the most famous algorithms that Google uses to classify cat images. So we want to put instead of light wave, a cat image. And on the screen, we want to know whether it's a cat or something that's kind of similar to a cat from the cat family or something that which is totally different for, for example, it's a dog or a wolf. So what we really need to understand is how exactly to control this uh, system, how exactly to encode this cat image in a quantum world, and how do we control this system by putting this two slits such that we get a computational result what we expect uh, using following the laws of quantum mechanics. Quantum technologies as such, the term is quite broad, and uh, this is from the Curo, which is the quantum, uh, quantum Europe flagship program that's there in the Europe uh, landscape. So, uh, it talks about the various different technologies, what, uh, the, what the term, the umbrella term of quantum technology mean. And you can see the example of all of them and it's arranged from left to right based on how, how far we are or how difficult it is to realize these technologies. So at the end, you see this universal quantum computer, what we are going to talk more about in the rest of the uh, lecture. And this is like the plan of Europe to develop these kind of technologies. So like you don't have to go through all of the text in this slide, but basically you see that it's divided into three parts, something which is going to happen uh, in the zero to five year time timeline. So this already a, a bit old, so already from uh, four years back. And then some technologies are going to be developed over a course of five to 10 years. And then something happens in the 10 plus year timeline. Of course, we are interested in the final things, like what is the final uh, product of all the small uh, quantum sensors or atomic clocks? What will they finally be used for? Uh, it will be used mostly for things like communication, like quantum internet or a quantum computer. So the final goal is to have either something like a general purpose computer, which will be exceeding uh, the power of classical computation, or on the other hand, of course, you can replace the Europe with worldwide. So we will have, a, let's say, a worldwide quantum internet uh, where we'll be using secure quantum channels 
uh, for transferring information between different parties. So this idea of uh, quantum computation and uh, general relativity uh, in the early 1900s were also going in parallel with another revolution which was happening and that was in the field of computation. There was again uh, spearheaded by a lot of people over here, I just, uh, like Alan Turing over here, who invented or who described what is known as a Turing machine which is a very simple model of computation. And based on this model, uh, based on this very simple model, we have what, uh, what we know as the classical computation. So every device that you know, whether it's a laptop or a supercomputer somewhere uh, in sitting in a chamber, uh, in somewhere far away in a cloud, uh, all, all the computers are based on the basic principles of a Turing machine. So they, they work according to the laws of classical mechanics and, uh, they can do a computation which belong to this particular class which a Turing machine can handle. So later on, somewhere in the 1980s, um, some physicists started asking a, a very different kind of question. And one of the famous persons to do that is Richard Feynman. And he started asking this question is, let's say you have a quantum system, uh, a quantum mechanical system, and you want to understand the computation of this quantum mechanical system on the computers that we have today. So, we have the classical computers and we want to understand uh, or simulate these quantum uh, quantum phenomena on the classical system. What happens there and how difficult is it to do that? And what they really found out that it is exponentially difficult to simulate these quantum systems on the classical computers that we use. Instead, if we have a, another quantum system that we can control by ourselves, so this was again a very theoretical idea at that time. So let's say we have another quantum system and we can control the properties of that system. Then we will be able to efficiently simulate this other uh, quantum system of interest that we want to understand the properties of or dynamic of. That was the idea, original idea from Richard Feynman and Yuri Manin. And that led to the theory of quantum computation again by people David Deutsch, Richard uh, Seth Lloyd, uh, Umesh Vazirani, and others. And the basic idea is uh, the world is governed by uh, quantum mechanics, not by classical mechanics. So the universe, if you look at the entire universe, you can think of it like a quantum computer, which is kind of calculating itself based on the laws of physics. So your program for the computer is the laws of physics. And then you have the computer, which is the entire universe, which is evolving. Uh, it's like computation, which is evolving. So that kind of gave the idea that it, which basically represents the entire universe, is made from a quantum information, which is a qubit. So let's try to understand what this term qubit really means and what actually happens behind this code of classical reality that we live in, which is macroscopic. We are much bigger organisms than an electron or a proton. And the rules that apply in this world of electrons and protons are very different from what happens in our own world around us. And they have very different strange properties, which makes quantum mechanics so difficult to understand. They are a bit counterintuitive to what happens in our world. And some of these properties that you see on the screen over here, are, let's say superposition. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, you have like superposition, interference, measurement, also you have entanglement and you have reversibility. So let's try to understand that from something really basic like uh, the hydrogen uh, atom. So uh, in the hydrogen atom, you have uh, in the nucleus one proton and then the electron can be in different orbitals. So these are like different energy levels. So for example, you have the, the ground state, which is, let's call it the zero energy level. And then we have the excited state, the first excited state, let's call it the one energy level. And then we can have even higher energy levels. But we already know from classical computation that uh, we do not really need multiple different levels. We can do all of computation using just two levels, which is like the zero and one. So uh, if we have a binary system, we can do all of computation. So that really uh, gave us the, let's say, the Schrodinger cat equi uh, principle where a cat can be both dead and alive at the same time, which means like the electron, like the 
the thought experiment with Schrodinger proposed is the electron can be both zero and one at the same time, as long as you're not looking. So what happens when you look, you would collapse the state zero and the one, the superposition state to either one of them based on some probability distribution. So that is the basics of quantum, mecha uh, quantum mechanics, which is also quantum computation. So you have uh, different energy levels and the quantum particle can be in all of them simultaneously with some probability, uh, with some amplitude, it's called amplitude. And then when you measure out them, you collapse the state, you collapse the superposition to one of them. So it cannot, once you measure it, it cannot be in all of them at the same time. And a lot of physicists among them, let's say Albert Einstein didn't like this idea. So he's, he quipped that uh, God doesn't really play dice. Uh, the world cannot be in multiple states at the same time. And then when you look, it collapses to, collapses to one of them. So that's not something which I, uh, Albert Einstein liked, to which Niels Bohr quipped, uh, don't tell God what to do. The laws of physics are what it is. Like all we can do as physicists is to understand the way the reality is behaving. And based on that, we need to do our calculations. So that's also uh, what we do in quantum computing. But in quantum computing, is the math is rather easy. So this is, I think, the only slides where there will be some equations in there. So it's basically the uh, probability theory generalized to complex numbers. So in probabilities, we work with numbers between 0 and 1. And uh, when an event can occur with the probability, the probabilities together add up to one. So one of the events should occur in, in a probability uh, theory, right? So in quantum computation, uh, not consider probabilities, we consider what's called as amplitudes, which can be complex numbers. So when they are complex numbers, we have the real component and the imaginary component. And uh, the magnitude of the complex number, so what we get when we square them up, some of them should and uh, should add up to one. So no longer the probabilities, but the square of the amplitude, which represent the probabilities add up to one. So now we uh, moving back to the example of a hydrogen atom, which can be in two states, uh, zero and one. Each of these states have an associate, uh, associated amplitude with it, which are complex numbers, uh, which has uh, like each of them has a real and an imaginary part. And the square of them, uh, once we add them, uh, the magnitude of those amplitude, uh, complex numbers together add up uh, to one. And the quantum uh, system over here, the entire, let's say the hydrogen, uh, the electron of the hydrogen atom is represented by this. So you add up the states, the zero and the one over here in the I part, and then uh, the amplitude associated with it. So you multiply the amplitude and the state and you add them up. So that's what a quantum state is all about. So that's one quantum state. Of course, one bit or one qubit is not very useful for doing computation. So what happens if you have multiple of these states? So let's say if you have two of these hydrogen atoms with, where the electrons can be in two places at the same time, then you get four complex numbers. So you have, let's say, two complex numbers for one of them, and then you have two complex numbers for the other state. And when you multiply them, what's called as a tensor product, you get a state which is made out of four complex numbers now. So now you can understand that if you have two qubits, uh, the total number of complex uh, numbers that you need to store that state in a classical computer. So what uh, I was talking about, what Feynman uh, was proposing that it's very hard to do on classical computation. The number of uh, values that you need to store in a classical computer is an exponential to the... So now if you have, let's say 200 qubits, the to this value, the 2 to the power 200 is already more than what's known as the Eddington number, which is more than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So there's absolutely no hope of simulating a 200 qubit system on a classical computer. So that's basically gives, gives rise to a term which is known as quantum supremacy, that we will reach a point where quantum computers become so big that there's no hope of doing that same calculation on a classical system, whatever way you would like to do, whether it's a supercomputer or not. So now you have stored the quantum information, but then you have to do some computation, right? So uh, just like in classical computers, there are different ways of doing uh, quantum computation as well. So there are a host of different um, models of com uh, quantum computation. I'm not going to uh, go into that. 
Uh, for example, one of them is AQC, which is called as adiabatic quantum computing. And a slight variant of that, where you also uh, allow diabetic evolution, you get what's known as a quantum annealing device, which is one of the first commercial available quantum computing device uh, from D-Wave in Canada. But uh, the most promising one, what most of the companies are working on is what's called as a circuit model quantum computing. And that is inspired by the same way that we design classical computation, which is based on logic gates. For example, you have the not and the and and the or. And of course, you have another uh, classical gate, which is called as a fan out, where you copy information to two different uh, wires or signals. So together, if you have all these, you can do any computation in the classical world. And in quantum computation, we have something similar. We have a set of what's known as a universal gate. So if you can make your computing device to do those kind of uh, computation, you should be able to do everything that a quantum computer can do. So that's already very powerful uh, result. Also in the quantum world, there are some gates, for example, the Toffoli gate, uh, where one single gate, so just using that one single quantum logic gate, you can do everything that a classical computer can do. Of course, then you have other quantum gates which allow you to do more than what classical computers do. But this uh, clearly says that quantum computation is uh, superior or is like a superset of uh, classical computation, it can do something which classical computers can't do. Let's move on to what's, uh, what, how a quantum algorithm looks like. So initially you start off with a state, a quantum state that uh, you can, it's very easy to prepare. So you know uh, what your state is, and then you encode whatever computation you want to do on the quantum algorithm, on the quantum states. And then you normally do what's a clever process, which I'm going to explain in the rest of the slide. And then you measure out. So as long as you have a superposition, so you have all these uh, places where the cat can be dead or alive, uh, you can manipulate those states, you can encode that function, you can do the clever process uh, simultaneously on all the states, on all the cat, dead and alive states, as long as you're not measuring. So once you measure it, you get just one reply from the quantum computer, which you hope that it is your answer. Sometimes you do not get the answer. So there will be times where, since it's probabilistic, there will be time when you do not get the answer right. So you have to repeat the experiment in a quantum computer multiple times so that you get a statistical distribution of your answer. And once you have with a very high probability, the right answer, for example, in this graph, then you know uh, that your computation has like, gives you a certain confidence of what the result that you get from your computation. Well, uh, in the world of classical computing itself, there are other models of computation. For example, the GPU, the graphics processing unit that we use mostly for gaming and uh, those kind of stuff where there are there are also a lot of cores in them. So let's uh, so the, this red figure is that of how the computation happens in a. So you have all these small cores taking care of one computation path, and finally you get the result out of all the computation path that you run on the GPU. So in uh, in a GPU you have all these parallel cores, very small. They can do very a simple task, but they work all in parallel, and at the end you get the result out from the GPU. Whereas in a probabilistic computer, probabilistic classical computer, you can make this pass interact with each other. So they can add up, for example, or, or subtract. But what happens in a probabilistic com uh, computer is the probabilities are between zero and one. So you cannot really subtract, uh, uh, like you cannot go below zero in that case. So you, uh, the wrong solution still end up having some positive probability. So that's the advantage that you get in a quantum computer where since you're working with complex numbers now, you can destructively interfere your computation paths. So let's say this is your wrong answer and this is another wrong answer. But now since one of them is a positive uh, number and another is a negative complex number, when they interact, they absolutely cancel each other. So that the solution, the right solution that you want gets a very high probability. So this is core from where the advantage in uh, quantum computation comes up. Uh, this might be a good time to take some questions if there are any. Uh, so if there are any questions, but uh, so we can raise hands and ask. Uh, I personally have a question. Uh, yeah. So 
when you were uh, mentioning about probability distribution, you said uh, that. Uh, so, so I'm assuming that probability distribution that you're talking about is normal distribution, uh, or is it uh, can it be anything else as well? Uh, uh, yeah. So when you initialize the system and when you just superpose it, you go into an uniform distribution. So all the solutions are then equally likely if you just uh, do this step and then you measure it out. For example, if you, let's say, want to multiply two numbers, two into two, and uh, you want to get the results, let's say four, right? So uh, once you superpose it, you will get all the results. So zero to, let's say, 16 with equal probability, and you won't understand the result that you, uh, like, it won't make any sense. So uh, you will get an equal distribution of all the outputs. So that's basically what happens in the clever process where, uh, like, Let's say if, if you want the answer to be 16, you make sure that all the other results from 0 to 15 destructively interfere with each other so that finally, when you measure out, you evolve this uh, uniform distribution to a distribution uh, in this clever process so that the distribution over here is peaked, like the there's a peak at 16. So the distribution becomes, let's say, in, uh, something like this, where uh, as long as the answers, the states are 16, you have a high probability, whereas the other states become much more uh, suppressed. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. So I think we can proceed and take questions at the end. OK, great. Uh, so uh, so far, I was talking about the basics of quantum computation and how to manipulate them and how to do computations with them. But what is the need to do quantum computation? Yeah, I said that you get some power out of the system. You can do some things that classical computers cannot do. But that was not really the motivation why people started working on quantum computation in the last five to 10 years. But that came from an entirely different perspective. And that came from the semiconductor industry. That's known as the slowdown of Moray's law. So all the computers that we have, like the classical computers are based on transistors. You might be already knowing this. Uh, and they are the ones that do the switching of on and off zeros and ones. And the Moray's Law uh, is an observation that the number of transistors that we can pack in a given area kind of doubles every 18 months. So this is like a law of human ingenu ingenuity, like how, how good we are in improving uh, innovation that every 18 months, we are able to come up with a way to pack more and more computing power in a small area. And it had its own uh, bottlenecks from various different factors. So we have to remove the heat out, otherwise it becomes very hot, or we have to reduce the clock frequency or work at 3.3 uh, volt instead of five volts. So it had its own, own like journey, for example, uh, uh, to say. But it had also some enabling, enabling factors. So it, uh, like it was, also bolstered by, uh, for example, better algorithms. So people came out with better algorithms to do things like uh, searching or sorting, for example. And also in the CMOS industry where, uh, VLSI industry, where people started uh, inventing better ways of packing these transistors on a chip. But this basically, the Moore's law is behind this entire computing economy that you see, like all the major companies uh, from Google, Apple, IBM, Intel, all, that, all their business is dependent on this factor that five years down the line, my laptop is going to get slow. There will be another better laptop in the market, which is faster. There will be a new operating system and I'm going to like sell my laptop and buy a new laptop, right? So this entire world economy, all the big companies are based on this fact that we'll, we will be keeping uh, like this trend of improving our computing device more and more. But that has its own bottleneck. So if you are packing more and more transistors in the small area, we will come to a point, of course, in some time in the future where these transistors are just like the a transistor has kind of three parts, the source, drain, and the gate. And the gate is what controls the movement of electrons on the, in the two different directions. So the gate will be as small as one atom wide. So one, you, once you go to that level where the gate is so small, the classical laws do not apply anymore. So the quantum laws apply and quantum laws gives those electrons kind of a bit more power that they can tunnel from one side of the source of the drain to the other side. So now your computing device won't be able to uh, scale up any further because you then are bought, like you're stopped by this laws of quantum mechanics from miniaturing the device any further. 
But on the other hand, our need for data processing is of course not going to stop. We have all these neural networks and deep learning. We have so many, uh, our entire society is dependent on data. So we need to find out alternate ways of doing computation. And a lot of people are looking at a lot of different ways. There's DNA computing, there's memristors, and one of another, of course, uh, technology is quantum computing, which probably holds the promise to carry forward this trend of uh, better and better computing device. So what is quantum good at? So we looked at quantum algorithms, but what is the application domain of these alg algorithms? And it seems pretty uh, wide from this chart from Gartner, which is a market re uh, research company. And you can pretty much apply it to all the scientific fields very easily because some of them has these properties of uh, either a very uh, complex optimization problem or a problem which is dependent on quantum mechanics in general. For example, in chemistry, there's a huge field uh, which is working on quantum chemistry. And in computation, of course, you have this optimization problems which are incredibly difficult to do on classical computers. So we have this quantum computers who might be uh, proving useful for them. And basically, uh, these applications can be classified as five or six fields that I sh will show on the right. And I have arranged them in order of how, how quickly or how fast we are going to see the impact of this application. The first one is, of course, in the domain of quant uh, quantum communication. We are already seeing a lot of companies working on it. Even in India, I think there's a company called QNU working on quantum communication and quantum key distribution. So that's basically securing information transfer between two uh, nodes. When you are securing it with quantum, uh, by the laws of quantum mechanics, even if you have an, uh, an attacker in the middle of the communication channel, they won't be able to understand anything. So it will be easily detected by these two parties because uh, once you measure out a system, you destruct you destroy the quantum superposition. So both the parties will be able to understand that there has been an intruder to your quantum system. So your system kind of becomes uh, very secure from that. Then again, we have quantum simulation. So this is the original dream of Feynman that if you have a quantum system, can we simulate it and understand the properties of it? And it's going to have a lot of application in the field of material science. So we'll be able to design new materials as well as design as a better quantum computers in the process. A lot of applications is, of course, in optimization, a lot of industrial use cases there to save money. There is a huge field of quantum machine learning, which kind of deserves a lecture by itself. And there is, let's say, a quantum version for pretty much everything that's there in the classical world. So we have, let's say, the general uh, generative adversarial networks over here, uh, variational autoencoders, principal component analysis, the k-means. There's a quantum version for each of them. This cryptography, uh, that, so cryptography is going to need a little big quantum computer that's at least five years away from now. But once this comes up, uh, a lot of our internet transactions will be at risk because quantum computers will be able to hack them more easily. And finally, we also have quantum search, which is very generic. Uh, generic. This is also what I'm working on. So when you have to search a database and you do not have a better way of understanding what's in the database, uh, a quantum computer gives a lot of advantage in that field. A lot of traction recently has been in not writing the quantum programs by yourself. So that becomes very difficult to do because you need to understand a lot of uh, not only classic uh, quantum mechanics, but a lot of uh, theoretical computer science as well. A lot of uh, traction nowadays is on letting, letting the computer write the program for you. So this is not only happening in the quantum world, this is happening also in the world of uh, classical computing. So that is basically what neural networks is all about, where the programmer no longer writes the software. The programmer tells you, tell, teaches the computer how to write, write the software for it. And this is how basically what a neural network looks like. And now we have a quantum kind of version for it, which is known as a quantum approximate uh, optimization algorithm, where we do not write the quantum program, but tell what is the objective that we want to optimize. And then the computer will search the best quantum gate or the quantum circuit for you. But there are, of course, engineering challenges. The road is not as smooth as I described so far. So this is like how the computers looked in the early, let's say, 50s, 1950s. They were like taking an entire building. The classical computers were as big as that. That is, like, let's say, before the transistor era. 
when computers were made with vacuum tubes. And that is basically what classic uh, quantum computing is right now. So the moment you try to make these qubits, they are very fragile. So any environmental factors on this qubit uh, destroys the superposition. So the system collapses and you cannot gain out more information from that computation. So firstly, the what most uh, experimental physicists try out is to isolate the system from the environment. So the, the quantum chip is put inside dilution refrigerators and these refrigerators are at 20 millikelvin. So that's already a lot much colder than outer space. And this is cooled by liquid uh, helium. So this chip right now uh, is now effect, uh, like shielded from the effect of temperature. And then uh, we, the structure that you see around us shields it from the Earth's magnetic fluctuations. So, so that's a lot of engineering that's going on into making uh, de this device controllable based on how we want to control, not based on the environment. But there's also quantum error correction, uh, which works very differently from classical error correction. So in the classical error correction, you can take one data and you can make copies of it. So if you take one data and you make three copies of it, and then one of them gets destroyed, like we do it in space, uh, space science all the time. What, an, alpha, an alpha particle hits your data and uh, the data gets destroyed you still have two other copies of the data and you can reconstruct the entire data from those two copies. But in the quantum world, you cannot do that. There's something called as a quantum no, no cloning theorem. So you cannot copy a quantum information. You cannot clone it. So there is entirely different strategy for doing quantum error correction where you distribute one quantum information over multiple qubits. And then uh, if some of those qubits gets destroyed, you can still uh, understand what the original quantum information was from the rest, from the remaining uh, qubits. You can kind of understand what the information was. So from this engineering challenges, uh, like what I showed in the second slide in the 2016 timeline of what we want to have in the future, one thing that became very clear that we are not going to have an universal quantum computer that's going to take over the world of classical computation. So we are not going to replace every classical computer that we have with quantum computers. Instead, what we are going to have is called as quantum accelerators. So we are going to look at what an accelerator is, and that's exactly what a specialized computing device is called. So there are multiple different accelerators already used uh, in the computer systems that we have today. As I said, that there's already the GPU, which is the graphics processing. So we still have our CPU inside our laptop, right? So uh, as long as it is doing something trivial, for example, running the operating system, it is taken care of by the host CPU. But the moment you start doing something which is specialized, for example, you start to play a game and then you have to do a lot of graphics processing, then that computation is offloaded to this GPU. It does the computation and gives the result back to the host CPU and then it shows you, like, uh, shows it on the screen, right? So we have this specialized processors which do different tasks which are suited for uh, the different applications that we have and quantum computing is going to be like an accelerator so there will be some very specific tasks with which are better for quantum computation but the rest of the things we're still going to do it on the other other processors that you see over here and those specific tasks are going to be offloaded to the quantum computer so that is basically what quantum supremacy is all about a lot of people have this idea that Quantum supremacy means that all the classical computers are going to go away and we are going to have this quantum computer taking up this entire space. But that's not true. Like the classical computers are going to do what they are good at, but there are some tasks where quantum computers are better. So that is this small uh, hole that you see in this uh, field where quantum computers are going to do one specific task, some very, very specific task, which classical computers will never be able to do. And that's what we are going to use the quantum computers for. Of course, making a quantum computer is not easy. So we have the algorithms down to the qubits, which is basically holding your quantum information. It's exactly like bits. And in between them, in between the algorithms and the quantum chip, we have all these different layers. So the algorithm needs to be translated to something like an assembly instructions, which needs to be, uh, which needs to be understood by the computer of where to put that information, to take those assembly information and translate to, uh, where the gates or what are the pulses that are going to go into this uh, quantum chip. So that's done by all these layers and all these layers working on or researching on all these layers 
requires very different kind of expertise. So as you see over here that some of them requires knowledge from computer science, math, or theoretical physics. Also, there are uh, fields where you need knowledge of microelectronics, uh, engineering physics, and there are the in-between layer, which is mostly handled by computer engineers and elect uh, electronics and electrical engineers. So this is making a quantum computer is a very interdisciplinary effort where you need a very high collaborating team to, do, to build this entire quantum stack. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying that there, there is this quantum hardware which we do not really have at the level that we want it. There are a lot of experiments going on in the world at different labs and there are multiple ways of making qubits. So there, are, there is the superconducting circuits, which is mostly used by all the like top companies like IBM, Google, T-Wave. There is a trapped ion. So there are multiple different ways of encoding a quantum information. And uh, these are these, let's say, five different ways. Uh, trapped ion is explored by another company called Ion Cube. You have the silicon quantum dots, which uh, Intel is working on. We have the topological qubit which Microsoft works on. And again, we have uh, diamond vacancies, which is also worked on by uh, Microsoft and uh, Intel. So there are multiple different uh, ways of storing quantum information. And you can think of it like the vacuum tube error. We do not really have a transistor, uh, like the same version of a quantum transistor yet. And people are exploring different ways of what to build a system, what to build a computer out of. And these are the basically different candidates that uh, many different people are exploring to see which one of them will prove the best in the long run. And then on the software side, we have different uh, with different algorithms. We have the proof that these algorithms will work. Uh, so that's very mathematical. We have the mathematical proof. We have the different applications where the algorithm can be used for. And finally, of course, we have to show that it works. So we have to. Uh, write the program for a particular quantum computer and show that it is actually working. But there is a huge gap right now. So there is the hardware is not really well developed to, uh, to, uh, to already apply these algorithms on the hardware. Whereas the software, we have a lot of algorithms, but we do not know where to apply them on. So the early work which was done in quantum algorithms was mostly in the algorithm and proof sector. So we had a very artificial or abstract algorithm. And then we had a proof that if you do it on quantum, you are going to get an advantage. And there has also been a lot of work done on quantum processors, so just controlling these qubits uh, and to make sure that it's able to store and compute quantum information. In the last five to 10 years, there has been a lot of focus on integrating uh, these three. And there are basically three ways in which people are exploring how to integrate this. So one of them is to take the algorithm and the proof and try to show it on a quantum computer. So to do that experimentally, the algorithm that you have. The thing that is missing in this is we do not really know what is the application of this. So we have a very abstract algorithm, for example, understanding if a distribution is random or not, and try to do that on a, uh, or have two distribution and to see whether those randomness are cor correlated or not, and to do that on a quantum computer. So that is one of the quantum supremacy experiments that uh, Google and IBM are trying to do. Then on the other uh, end, we have quantum application development where it is very hard hardware agnostic. So we are not looking at implementing it right away. We have the algorithm, we have the proof, and we are trying to find applications of the algorithms in the real world. So this is basically what I work on. And finally, there is the middle road, the right and the left. And uh, so these people try to take the algorithm and try to scale down the application so that we can already demonstrate that on some form of quantum computer that we have today. So this is partly in green because some part of the computation right now is done by classical computer and some part of the computation is done by a quantum computer. So this is not a fully quantum, what's known as a universal quantum computer, but it's a hybrid computer of partially classical and partially quantum uh, device. So these are the three ways that different research labs are exploring. Uh, coming towards the end of the stock, uh, let's move on to the investment sectors and uh, what are the different people who are working on them. So this is recently from QRECON, uh, like released in 2020 towards the end. 
and this uh, this shows that the different investments in different countries in the world and you can see that india also has a lot of investment in this sector but this is only the government investments uh, that's uh, there in this chart but there are also other other directions from which money flows in the sector they have the private and startup companies we have the public companies universities and finally a lot of venture capitalists are investing uh, in this technology so what's right now needed of course it's a very high risk high gain field uh, so you have to take huge leaps and huge risks if you are if you want to start your research in this field still there is a lot of in innovation needs to be done and uh, the main thing that we need is we need motivated young researchers like a lot of you that you are participating today a good thing about quantum computing is uh, when you go into a one direction in this field and you see that nothing has been done, uh, most of the time in other fields, the answer is because uh, it's not promising enough. So let's say you cannot apply neural networks to understand a cat from a tiger. So uh, people have tried doing that and have results that you cannot do that. But if you have some kind of uh, the same thing in quantum computation, most of the time the answer is people have not tried doing that. So it's a very low hang, you will find a lot of low hanging fruits that if you want to do something and you uh, kind of try to research and see whether you can do that on quantum computation, most of the time the answer is yes, you can do it. You get a lot of advantage doing it on quantum computation and nobody has tried doing that. So you can easily set your research field in this line. Finally, we need quantum hackers with, who are not really afraid to go into this direction. There are a lot of research resources available on, on the web uh, nowadays. So you can already start working on uh, these tools that are available on a cloud, the quantum computers. And there are a lot of simple algorithms that you can try and test it yourself. Uh, if you want to do a master thesis or a bachelor thesis in, in our department at UDELF or in University of Porto, uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn. And most of the things that we work in our lab is to do with algorithms, uh, compilers and architectures, so the computer architecture uh, of computer. Most of the questions that uh, someone new to this field asks is, where do I begin? So here I'll put up some uh, resources over here. And some of them is known as the awesome resources. So this is basically a list of other web links where you can find multiple different uh, resources that you can look at. There can be videos, there can be courses. And uh, the first link, uh, I'll put up this presentation on my website so I can download the presentation later on. And I think uh, a recording of this session will also be there on YouTube so you can check out these links. And uh, these lists are very elaborate, so you might get uh, worried that there's so much to learn in this field. So there are some YouTube videos that I recommend. These are very short videos to get yourself, under, uh, start understanding how the world of quantum computation is all about and how to start. Uh, I'll just end with my personal quantum journey. So I started uh, like learning quantum computation when I was uh, like studying in IIST. So that's in 2012, there was a course from Umesh Wazirani, who is also one of the co-founders of quantum information theory. And that was, uh, at that time it was on Coursera. Right now the course is there on edX. It's also one of the best courses I recommend if you want to start learning quantum computation. And it's called quantum mechanics and quantum computation. And then, as uh, like, uh, then I joined ISRO and was working there in the satellite section. And then I started. Uh, I wanted to do my master's degree. I want to continue my education further. And I was looking for something which is even more challenging than space science because I was already working on it. And that's where I remember that I learned something about quantum computation. And I uh, I uh, like applied for a master's degree at Utah. And Tudel, we have a very broad variety of quantum courses. So you start with a fundamental of quantum information course, but then you can go into cryptography and communication, or you can look at the electronics part. Or if you are interested in computer science, you can go into the quantum information part. So I took those courses, and then I wanted to do some kind of research on it for my master thesis. And I wanted a problem which is very challenging uh, and nobody has looked at at that time. And one of the things which I was interested in was genomics. So I wanted to understand what genomic, what is the challenge in data processing in genomics and whether quantum has an advantage in that field. So that's basically what I did my master thesis on and also 
working on right now in my PhD. And that's basically what I work on quantum accelerated genomics. So you can have a DNA sequence, for example, of that of human being, and then you have a disease and I go to a doctor. In the future, the doctor is not going to prescribe the same medicine to all of you. It's what's known as personalized medicine. They are going to take a sample of your DNA and understand what is the exact place in your DNA which has the problem. And based on that, they are going to make a medicine or prescribe a much more precision medicine for you. Uh, and that's basically what the future is, but that requires a lot of data processing. And that might be one of the places where quantum computing can come in. What if we do not know what, uh, what organism, uh, a new organism comes up? For example, the coronavirus, we had no clue of how the DNA or the RNA of that virus looks like. So that's basically what I was working on in, uh, last year in the first year of my PhD, where you do not know an organism, but you still want to understand its uh, genomic structure. So that's basically what's called as de novo sequencing. And I designed a quantum algorithm for that. And right now, uh, what I'm working on is to understand the DNA data. So uh, what does the DNA really mean? What is the meaning of life? So what I'm doing is this is like, say, the ma model of the interactions uh, between a coronavirus and a human being. And I'm trying to design a quantum Turing machine, which will take this distribution and tell me uh, what, why is the virus affecting the human being? At what is the code in the virus which is causing this information, uh, which is causing this infection uh, in the human cell? So that is the algorithm that I'm working on in, uh, in for my PhD right now. And uh, just to give you a heads up, on 16 January we are going to have another session, but probably I guess there will be another announcement on that. And again, welcome to the world of quantum computation. This was the introductory session today. But on 16, we have a panel discussion. Uh, there, there are going to be some industry experts and academic experts who are going to talk about, and we, we can ask questions over there, and we're going to address them in the next session. Thank you. Uh, hi, am I audible? This Prachi yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll take up some questions. And first of all, uh, thank you very much from the ISTA side for your wonderful talk on this uh, exciting topic of uh, quantum computing. So the first question uh, is from Manish. Uh, Manish, can you just uh, unmute and tell? Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Prachi. Uh, so I just wanted to ask what is uh, what what this qubit exactly is. What, what what component of the qubit actually brings randomness or the probability distribution that we were talking about? Uh, yeah, so a qubit from the physical point of view are these quantum systems, very small quantum systems that you control in some way. For example, this is a, a loop where magnetic flux can flow. And that gives you the property. So the magnetic flux can either flow clockwise or anticlockwise but you can make it to flow on both directions at the same time, which is called as a squid. And you can do that to, con uh, to store quantum information and to transform uh, quantum information. So a qubit, the full form of it is quantum bit or quantum binary digit. So uh, in information theory, it is basically a way to store quantum information, but in the physical world, you have to make some kind of a device to store that information. And that is made by this uh, different quantum particles or different hardware uh, hard ways of making them. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now the second question is from Sudev. Sudev, can you unmute and uh, tell? Or else I'll just read it. Uh, so, he's asking that, is there any way to know whether the result uh, that we get from the quantum computer is correct or what quantum computer does uh, is ac uh, actually quantum? Like uh, what the quantum computer is doing is actually quantum. Uh, yeah, so there's two part to it. In the first part is, is there a way to know uh, what answer you are going to get? Uh, 
No, not in advance. So as long as you're writing a quantum algorithm, what you mostly do is you test it on a very small system. For example, let's say, for example, sake, uh, you want to write a quantum algorithm to multiply two numbers. So now try it with just uh, one digit number. So you just tested that uh, it works for two, uh, two times two, and you are getting four all the time or most of the time. And once you, so you can already simulate that on a very small classical system and understand that your quantum algorithm is right. And then you scale it up to a huge system. But then when, when you have the huge system, then you cannot simulate it on a classical system anymore. So you cannot verify that the, uh, your computation was done in the way that you wanted it to. And that is basically what quantum supremacy is all about, that you cannot test using a quantum system that the, uh, using a classical system that the quantum system works work correctly. But uh, there is a class of problems which we are mostly interested in, which is the NP uh, complete or NP hard class. And these are the classes of problems which are difficult to solve, but easy to check. So if you can make a quantum algorithm, which kind of accelerates a little bit the uh, NP, NP hard problems, and then you get a solution out of the, uh, out of the algorithm when you measure it out, it's pretty easy to check that your answer is right. For example, you have the traveling salesman problem. It is incredibly difficult to solve it, but if you have a quantum algorithm and it gives you a reply, you can check whether your answer is correct or not. Uh, the next question is from Litu. Uh, Litu, can you unmute them? Yeah. yeah, yeah. First of all, like thanks for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned that there are several variants of uh, conventional neural networks using like quantum computing, like your QGAN and QVAEs and Q neural networks. So, so I was wondering, is there any biological like motive behind this kind of implementations? Do you think that uh, there is some quantum communication among the neurons in our brain? Uh, yeah, that's a very nice question. Uh, there is an entire uh, entire separate field called quantum bi uh, biology. And uh, in the field of quantum biology, the researchers are trying to understand whether nature uses quantum computation uh, in, in the biological world. So uh, there has been uh, like research on whether com uh, communication, quantum computation is used in the biological world. And uh, there has been some evidence that it is used in the phot photosynthesis process by plants. And uh, it's also used in the navigation of birds. So birds use it uh, for doing navigation in their brains using magnet magnetic fields. So there are some evidences that the biological world uses quantum computation. And uh, of course, uh, you were asking about neural networks. So uh, one of the famous quantum uh, physicists called uh, Roger Penrose, he, ha he, he loves to believe that uh, quantum computation is at the core of our brains. So we need to understand quantum neural networks to understand our brain better. Uh, but this research is very early to just conclusively say something. A lot of people are working on that. And it might be quite true that uh, nature uses quantum computation uh, in the biological world as well. Uh, yeah, thanks. Like I have a few more questions. If there are no more questions, I'll be happy to ask it now. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. So you mentioned that like neural networks cannot classify like uh, cats and dogs. Uh, do you yeah. have any references where we can get some experiments on uh, that? This, uh, there's the cat and dog example was more like a toy example, but uh, there is some work on classifying MNIST. So that's the handwriting digit recognition using quantum computation. And uh, recently there was one work done by I think Zanadu, uh, who tried to classify a 10 class problem using a quantum computer. Quantum computer. So there is some work uh, on MNIST handwriting recognition on quantum computation. Yeah, uh, thanks. I have just one last question. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is, uh, if you can go back to slide 13. Yeah, so here is a very nice diagram of neural networks, and these parameters are usually updated using backpropagation algorithm, uh, right? So, right. like, I was wondering, like, how do you update the quantum parameters? Yeah, I mean, uh, if there is something you are saying that it cannot be measured efficiently, 
so in classical back propagation, you usually change the parameters a little bit, and then you try to measure how much change is happening in the output, and then you simply do the back propagation and gradient descent. So in quantum parameters, like how do you actually update these parameters? How do you learn these parameters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is like the quantum circuit that we have, and uh, the quantum circuit is run in a quantum computer. So uh, in the quantum circuit, uh, we have this different quantum gates that you see these boxes over there, and each of these boxes are uh, has a parameter attached to it. So that is like the angle values that you see over here, uh, theta zero, theta one, and all this. So these uh, these theta uh, theta n is basically what you want to train. So that is exactly like uh, these edge weights in a neural network, and that is done by another classical optimizer right now. So this quantum circuit. So you start off, let's say, with some random theta, uh, four theta random values, and then you run this quantum algorithm once, and you measure out the system, and then another classical optimizer uh, takes this measurement results from your quantum algorithm, and tweaks these parameters, these theta parameters for the next run. So it tells you that uh, with this quantum circuit, you are getting, let's say, a fitness of 50. Now let's try uh, changing the theta parameters by plus five or minus five and see what the result that you get. So then if you get, let's say, a positive result, if your fitness increases with a higher angle, then you take that as a better solution. So that is very similar to gradient descent, uh, except that over here we have the quantum circuit running instead of the classical uh, landscape search. Uh, so is this, is this happening in a like continuous space or it's like discrete optimization? Uh, it can be both continuous and discrete. So the continuous version is what's called as the variational quantum eigensolver. The discrete mm -hmm. version is called as the variational optimizer. So I don't know whether this is visible. This is very small. But this is basically how it works. You take one quantum circuit, the uh, violet part, and you run it and you get the result. And then you have an optimization landscape based on, uh, and this is an entirely classical uh, algorithm, which moves around this, in this classical landscape and tells you what quantum circuit to run in the next iteration. So this iteration continues for uh, 100 or 1,000 times to train this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just one last question. Like, If you are trying to model a classical neural network using quantum neural networks, uh, will there be an increase in the number of parameters or will there be a redux significant reduction in the number of parameters like how will the parameters scale uh, normally it's like believed that it, you will get an exponential uh, reduction in the memory so you let's say if you have 100 or 1024 uh, neurons you should be able to store the data of 1024 neurons in uh, 10 qubits so like that's the promise, but not always everything works the way the theory <laughs> says. So when you start applying, you will see that there are much more integrate interfaces involved in doing that encoding. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. That's all. Okay. Yeah, the next question is from Ankit. Uh, Ankit, can you just unmute and ask? Audible. You're audible, but your voice is quite lower. So I was just saying about that film Ant Man. Uh, have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. So there are things. Uh, actually, there are things that says that uh, there are different. There's a different parameter of time ranging in films for that. That five days, five hours. So. I'm basically asking a, a overall question that do you think it is that realistic or not? It's just in the. Uh, I don't uh, completely remember the movie, but there are a few things which are based on this macroscopic phenomena of superposition and entanglement. So, uh, like, I didn't discuss much about entanglement. And I, I don't exactly remember, but I think the Ant Man and the Wasp were. Uh, some kind of entangled in a way so that it's a stronger form of correlation. So if you, if you let's say, inter, uh, entangle two cats and keep them in two different boxes, and you, if you move one of the boxes to the part of the universe, and the cat is bought, like each of the cat can be bought dead and alive, but now we have entangled them. And then you, if you open the box, one of the box, which is there with you, 
and you see the cat is dead then you can uh, like be sure that the other cat the one that you have sent across to the other part of the universe is also dead so that is like a stronger form of correlation where even though information is not tra like traveling at the speed of like faster than the speed of light between uh, these two cats uh, it, it still has the same kind of influence on the experimental results that you get from this fact so uh, like of course ant-man and the wasp as a movie will be a more commercial version of these uh, theories um, but there is some truth in uh, the fact that the quantum realm is very counterintuitive and difficult to understand from the classical world that we exist in. Yeah, but it is possible. Uh, I don't exactly remember the reference that you were talking about of time slowing down. But uh, in quantum, there's one funny thing that uh, time is uh, reversible. So there's no direction of the arrow of time. So if you go from the past to the future, or if you go from the future to the past, from a computation point of view, it's the same. So every gate that you apply in the quantum world is reversible. And that has this implication that it's easier to do computation. It doesn't take a lot of energy, but it also makes it very counterintuitive, like you said. Thank you, Bea. Uh, next, uh, Shashank, can you just ask your question? Uh, okay, I'll read it out. Uh, he's asking that what exactly is collapsing of the state when uh, one observes the system, but the system behaves normally when no one is observing and uh, whether the latest statement has been proven or is it just in the principle? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, what exactly is meant by this collapsing of the superposition state is a very highly debated topic and I'll not go into that because like all the people that you see over here in this picture from Einstein and Niels Bohr and Marie Curie and Max Born, those people were debating at that time of what does, what does this ontologically mean that the wave function collapses and as long as you do not observe it, it works in one way and if you observe it, it works in another way. And uh, this debate is far from being resolved because it's about the nature of how reality is, uh, is and we really do not know that, except that the mathematical uh, formulation of it works perfectly in every single experiment that we have done. So as long as uh, we are not observing, uh, it, it behaves like a wave just because uh, if you observe so a super, uh, an inf interference pattern, that is only achievable when you have a wave. So as long as you are getting this pattern, you kind of infer that it might have been like a wave. It was like traveling like a wave uh, in this region. Of course, we have not observed this region, but since we are getting this interference pattern like you would get if you have something like a water wave, you kind of infer that the, uh, the electron could have been like a wave, what's known as the Schrodinger uh, wave function and uh, is behaving based on that wave and we are getting the results out when we are measuring it uh, like when we are collapsing the superposition. so yes the it's there's no way to prove it because it's beyond the realm what we can prove it's like asking a question which is so fundamental that we cannot go into that uh, so that's where there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics which is like the copenhagen interpretation uh, like uh, it's one of the popular ones, but there are also like cubism, then uh, quantum Bayesianism, then we have the, the many world hypothesis, we, uh, we have the, uh, the pilot wave theory. So there are multiple different ways of explaining what, what this duality is all about, that the wave and the particle nature are both present in the quantum world. Amrita, can you uh, ask the next question? Uh, 
Uh, I retrograde. Probably you can yeah. just uh, see in the yeah, chat. Uh, myself, right? uh, what exactly is quantum simulation? Is this a way where we can simulate quantum processes and it's working? Uh, yeah, so quantum simulation is un like this thing. Just a second. Yeah, so quantum simulation basically means that you have a quantum mechanical system and you want to simulate it much like the same way that uh, you can simulate any physical dynamics. For example, what happens on a on a billiard board or when you're having a, watching a cricket match, you can simulate if the ball is thrown in a way, which way you could have traveled had the batsman not been there, right? So that is basically what quantum simulation is, where instead of the ball, we have the quantum particles and we want to simulate how the system will evolve in time uh, based on the energy and the different parameters which are there in the system so that's basically what is quantum uh, simulation but then again we have another term which is very close maybe that's uh, that's what confuses you is there's something called as a quantum simulator so that is a classical computer which is trying to simulate this quantum phenomena so since right now we do not have big quantum computers which uh, we can already run our programs on what we end up doing is running this quantum simulation on a classical computer, which is of course uh, very difficult. It is exponentially costly in time and memory, but still we can do it. And that's what basically is called as a classical quantum computation simulator. And uh, so these are two different things. One is simulating quantum uh, systems, which is called quantum simulation. And the second thing is a classical quantum computer simulator. Yeah, I'll go to the next question. Uh, how exactly would a um, quantum computer do operation light a fan out, uh, which is constrained by the no cloning theorem? Uh, this is asked by Arun S. Um, yeah, so you're right that the no cloning theorem uh, restricts you from cloning. Well, so you cannot do a fan out. But over here, I said that there is one quantum gate, which is a Toffoli gate. Uh, which can do everything which a classical computer can do. And when I'm talking about what a classical computer can do, it means that you are working only with zeros and ones. You are no longer working with superposition states. So as long as you are working with zeros and ones, the no cloning theorem doesn't apply. So uh, the no cloning theorem applies that it cannot clone an arbitrary quantum state which means that if you have like some alpha zero plus beta one, then that cannot be cloned. But as long as you have just two basis states, zero and one, it can be plus or minus, or it can be anything. As long as you just have two states, you're working with exclusively two states, like a classical computation, you can clone in a quantum computation as well. So that is done by the Toffoli gate. So a Toffoli gate normally has like three inputs. So if you uh, set one of the inputs to zero, let's say if you set B to zero and set uh, the C to whatever you want to clone, uh, it can be a zero and one, and this is also to zero, then what you finally end up getting in uh, this two states is the cloned version. So if you have a one over here, you will get one, one. If you have a zero over here, you'll get a zero, zero. So you can clone classical information in a quantum computer. That's basically. Uh, yeah, so only orthogonal uh, states can be cloned and you can tune your system, you can design a quantum gate to clone any two states, whatever you choose. Uh, you can have a quantum gate that is going to clone only two states for you. For everything else, it's going to create an entanglement. So if you apply the C0 gate, which can be used to copy in a, a classical state, if you apply it to also an, uh, a superposition state, what it ends up doing is uh, it entangles them. I think there are no further questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, but I have a question. Uh, so yeah, sure. let's say for quantum uh, measurements or uh, in the field of quantum metrology, so is it like totally a uh, hardware related thing or uh, quantum computing can also like uh, uh, do some help with that thing, like uh, doing quantum measurements or uh, with that precision of uh, very small, you know? Uh, 
yeah so quantum measurements as you see in this uh, sensors field uh, quantum measurements is again based on the same theories of quantum uh, mechanics and but it's a bit not so much related in to quantum computation rather it will be the other way around once you have a better way of measuring out quantum systems you will be using that technology to improve your quantum computer uh, for it will be a part of the quantum computer. You also have to measure out the system, right? So uh, it's the other way around. You will probably not use quantum computer to improve uh, quantum sensors, but you are going to once, because quantum sensors is going to come up much uh, earlier. So you are going to use this quantum sensors uh, in the quantum computers to make them better. All right, uh, so thank you, Vaya, for all the questions and answers. Uh, I have Sesh a question. Uh -huh. yeah, sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask about phase kickback. Like, I'm confused. How does it physically work? Like, on paper, we can uh, perform mathematical operations and show that qubit remains unaffected. But how does it actually work physically? Yeah, so that's a bit technical question over here, and I don't really have the diagram for it. But uh, so the only thing is, it works exactly how what the mathematics say. So if you measure out a system and you see a particular output, uh, you can be sure that the rest of the state, which you didn't measure, has that phase in it. So uh, you don't have to worry how it exactly works. So if you, if you see the output of the bit that you are measuring out, uh, like let's say you are not measuring all of them in the phase kick, kickback, for example, in, in uh, Groover Surf or in, in quantum Fourier transform, if you have if you measure out the system and you see a particular output, the one that you need, you can be sure that the rest of the system has evolved exactly how your mathematics tells you. And uh, so this is again uh, happens like this uh, this figure over here. So if you see that the wave is over here, you can be sure that the electron has traveled through both of these particles. So that's basically counterintuitive again. So if you see the phase kickback. You might be wondering that it has traveled backward in time and given that phase to the uh, to the quantum state. But the reality is, uh, the phase was both there and not there. But now you have selected a computation path where the phase kickback has happened, and you have uh, like diminished the probability of the path where the kick phase kickback uh, did not happen. Okay, so uh, on paper, what we could have done is uh, for the unmeasured qubit, we could have introduced another factor but we didn't for example uh like we could introduce something like minus one to the power fx for example to the unmeasured qubit. yeah yeah but you cannot introduce minus one to the power fx like uh like like you do in a classical computation because it has to be a quantum gate so uh, it has to be unitary it has to be reversible so we have this uh constraints of what you can and cannot do in a quantum computation so there's like no second way of doing it just by uh, putting the phase. You can have an oracle, for example, where you will mark only the phase, only the state that you want uh, in your superposition. But you cannot do a phase kickback by a, uh, by by having another gate which is not unitary. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, I think I'll hand over uh, to Vibhuti. Excuse me, I had a doubt. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I was uh, recently learning about the teleportation algorithm. So what I got to know is that during the algorithm, the qubits have to somewhat, uh, the far of qubits, a bit far of qubits that are there, they have to bit become, bit, become a bit closer to each other during the algorithm. So in reality, is it like that the physically they come closer to each other or how is it? Uh, yeah, so Yeah, so let's say this is like the teleportation circuit. And uh, so you start off with a bell pair, 
uh, and then you send one of those bell pairs to two different parties. So this is, let's say, Alice and Bob who wants to teleport their information between uh, them. And uh, what Alice does, it, it encodes the information that it wants to send using this particular circuit. But then, as you said, that they have to come closer to each other. Once you do the measurement, you have to send this bits to Bob so that uh, Bob can decode the information that uh, has. So as long as you do not do that, uh, Bob, if Bob measures over here, he will get an equal probability of zeros and ones. It will not get the information that Alice wants to send him. So that is also the reason that even though tele uh, uh, quantum entanglement can affect have a correlation between two different ends of the universe, you cannot use tele uh, quantum entanglement or quantum teleportation to send a bit faster than the speed of light. So since this is a classical information, the double lines that you see over here, that has to go through a classical information channel, and then you are bounded by the speed of light that Einstein uh, worked out. So only when this information from Alice reaches Bob, Bob will be able to understand what the, uh, what is the information that Alice is trying to send. Well, in the quantum hardware, like do the qubits that are a bit far off, do they come closer to each other in the quantum computer in actuality? Uh, yeah, so for example, if you want to teleport, so this is, let's say, a picture of our Delft campus, and this is like the physics department, this is uh, the nuclear physics department, and you want to teleport information between A and B. So what you can do is you can have, uh, uh, you, have you have to have a classical channel between them so that you have to send this two bits. So uh, so this is not really like uh, as we see in, uh, see in uh, Star Trek that you are able to teleport an entire person from one place to another. So that's not going to work because uh, this information has to be transferred classically. It has to go through this communication channel. Uh, what it can uh, do rather is it can transfer a quantum bit of information from one place to another and uh, using this two bits of classical information. So that's only what teleportation can do. You can use uh, two bits of classical information to transfer one bit of quantum information. And it's not like you can do a lot of sci-fi things with it. Uh, yeah, sorry to say that. Okay, thanks a lot, yeah. There's no further questions. I think we can close the session. Yes, uh, so I think there are no more questions. Uh, over to Vibhuti Vibhuti for closing remarks. Thanks, Manish. Uh, very thanks to Aritra for such an enlightening and intriguing discussion. And in fact, it covered an entire range of uh, subjects from physics to electronics to computing to mathematics and in fact to biology. Thus, uh, in fact, setting up the tone for the 16th presentation that we have on 16th January, which will be moderated by Aritra himself. So we look forward to uh, hearing a lot of uh, technical stuff from him there. And that would be more of a panel discussion in which we will have eminent researchers from uh, Raman Research Institute and IIST and uh, our own alumni, Dr. Kanaf Setia. So in fact, there will be some discussions on quantum communication, quantum computing, and what research opportunities are there in India from quantum communications point of view. One thing, in fact, which is very clear from Aritra's presentation and in a very nice way, he mentioned how interdisciplinary it is. So there, in fact, is no barrier for being a novice or sub not a subject expert in physics or mathematics or something. And one can easily pick it up from someplace and then start learning and building it up. Very th we are extremely thankful to Aritra for such a nice presentation. And we look forward to, like he, as he told, we will be beamed up on 16th. And hopefully, we'll have an enlightening and very promising and enthralling discussion there. Thank you, Aritra, again. Thank you.